God is so good. Um, you know, um, what we'll put on my heart to continue on with our lesson that we uh, had last time when we were together when I was up here before Man. the last Bible study that we had was we were talking about grace, the grace of God. Amen. And God had put on my heart some examples in the Old and the New Testament of the grace of God. And I was sharing with y'all that uh, the Lord had, uh, I mean, I know the Lord inspired me by what he had Bishop teach on uh, when he taught on Samson and how God, grace was on Samson. That was so powerful and it's something that God wants us to get used to uh, walking in the grace of God. You know, uh, when we are, I, well, I can't speak for all y'all, I can only speak for myself, but I know a lot of us have had similar experiences in uh, being raised in church uh, from a young child and uh, you get this preconceived notion that people seem to give off about the Lord, you know, that he's God of wrath and, you know, you know, that, you know, mess up when it comes to life and roll. never seen anybody like that. People think it's talking about life and but right. that don't necessarily mean that's the Lord doing right. that. Exactly. A lot of times, unfortunately, we, we live in a world where I should say, unfortunately, we live in a world that's a fallen world, and things happen in the fallen world. Uh, what our enemy does is, the, the Bible says the enemy, our enemy has blinded the people in this world's mind that they can't even yeah. see what's going on with the glorious gospel, that they're blinded from the glorious gospel. So, you know, really, you know, he don't have the power to keep you blind if you truly are seeking truth. That's right. Because no devil in the hell can stop you from receiving truth. But you have to want us to receive the truth. When we, when we, when we are born into this world, we're born in sin. But we thank the Lord, we, we don't have to stay that way. But that's really on us as individuals. We have to decide that we really want God. Because, like I said, growing up in America, I thought everybody knew that heard the gospel. There's a lot of people. I was a grown man in the army. You know, as a lady in my army career before I, I met uh, another staff sergeant. I was a staff sergeant at the time. And, met this other staff sergeant who had never even been to church in her whole life. American born, raised, and never been in church in her life. I, that, I, that messed me up. I'm from Florida, y'all, so, and you know, we, 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 to this day, they still call the South the Bible Belt, you know. So, uh, grew up with a lot of tradition, but a lot of tradition is not good. You know, a lot of the, our traditions are just that, the traditions of men. And we're taught stuff that the Lord has to unteach us when we come to Him and we truly get saved. But, you know, I grew up in church, got baptized as a young child, and I didn't get saved until I was a grown man. So anyhow, say I like to say this: that I'm still, as a very seasoned saint, learning a lot of things. You know, like Bishop says, man, the more you learn about God, the more you realize the, the, the less you know about Him. The more you, I need to know about him, praise yeah. God. So, said all that, that's just a kind of a walk into back into what we were saying. And I had this scripture put up on uh, the monitors that says Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. And there is a scripture in the book of Isaiah that speaks about the Father in the same way. It speaks about God in the same way. I can't remember it. Specifically, where the scriptures at, because when you Bible scholars help me out, uh, pull that one up and we'll look at that also. But in the meantime, what I'm saying about this, what, the reason I want this scripture up here, because we mentioned this last time we were having Bible study, and I want y'all to actually see the scripture. Uh, because you need to, uh, what I do when Bishop is teaching, man, I'm right, I'm taking, writing down the scriptures, I'm taking notes, because I want to go back. And see what God has for me out of what, what, what He's uh, given my vision. And it's been an awesome word here, you know, coming out of this house. Praise God for what God is doing. Like I said, I'm, I'm learning so much. I can't even remember learning this much since I was saved. When I, the first year I got saved, man, I was like, I was in a new world, you know, like it was a brand new world, like stuff I'd never heard before that I, when I learned about the Lord. But, uh, yes. But uh, the whole thing is, and, and people say this all the time, we hear stuff about, well, I've heard this before, I'll say, that the God of the Old Testament, and this 
Thank God it's unbelievers that say this. I've never heard a believer say this, that the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. No, it's not. The Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Amen. But we, we are living in this different dispensation. Amen. The Old Testament time was under the Old Covenant. Right. And the New Testament is a different. The Bible says a better covenant. Amen. That we're under. Praise God. I say we, you know what I mean by we as believers, because the Old Testament, uh, the, when you go into the Old Testament and you look at the Old Covenant, the covenant that God made with Abraham and the children of Israel, but it still applies to anyone that wants to believe, you know, you have to go back and study that out and you'll find out that even people that were strangers could be received in to a certain point, you know, in the Old Testament, but it's all a picture of what's going on in the New Testament also. But thank God for Jesus. Thank God for the blood of Christ. Because God can deal with us differently under the New Covenant than He did in the Old Covenant. Amen? And it's simply because of the blood. It's not because God changed. It's because now He can deal with us differently because of the blood of Jesus. The Bible says that in the fullness of time, Christ came. Christ was born. Amen? And He was you know, grew up, lived as a man, died on the cross, rose again for our justification, and praise God for our sanctification. Praise God. Amen. You know, so because we receive Christ, God can deal with us differently, amen, in these days, and under the New Testament. Praise God. Um, so I'm going to go to an Old Testament, I'm a, well, we'll discuss what we talked about before. I right, give you the scriptures. We'll, we'll look at the chapters uh, just so for your sake so you can write them down if you want to hear. And uh, then we'll uh, move on with this. Yes, sir? I think like the one you talked about in Isaiah mm -hmm. might be Isaiah 41, verse 4, okay. and maybe Isaiah 44, verse 6. Okay, go ahead and read one of them. It says, uh, Isaiah 41 verse 4 says, Who has worked and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am He. And then 44 6 says, Thus the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. I don't know if that was the exact similarity of what you were looking for. Uh, that's close. And Not it says, quite. There is no other God. something that he didn't know before and he can't 
change. He, he's not going to change. Praise God that God is like that, that he's God, that he doesn't need to change. We're the ones who need to continue to change. We continue to change. Praise God. Uh, the Bible says that uh, the Apostle Paul said, I die daily. And that's what we need to do, die daily to ourselves, die to our flesh and increase in him. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, so praise God. Let's go to um, 1 Samuel. Old Testament also. This is something we went over before. 
Also, uh, uh, I, I believe the point God wanted me to bring out in this lesson was about uh, us not taking the grace of God for granted. Amen. Amen. Because uh, what we have to understand is, even as believers, we can take the grace of God for granted. But there are consequences that comes when you don't, uh, when you take the grace of God for granted. When you do something uh, continually operating disobedience, even under the grace, even in the New Testament times, when you are doing stuff that's, because uh, technically speaking, when you, let's go to, uh, let me just go to 2 Samuel chapter 12, and let's see. Now here's another story about David, and what's happening here with David is, uh, David's in a situation where he has done some very wicked things. Now David is a man after God's own heart. To this day, the Lord still honors him for that. But David is a man just like all of us. Um, us being men and women, and we can fail. But thank God that, you know, when we fail, God does, it doesn't take God by surprise. Praise God. When Adam fell, God said he had a plan already before the foundations of the earth to restore mankind. Before man was ever created, he already knew what was going to happen. And so the Bible says that Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundations of the earth. Because, you know, when you think about it, what if Adam hadn't fell? Then sin wouldn't have entered the earth. But then at the same time, we would have never experienced how much, how far God was willing to go for us. How much he was willing to, to put on flesh and become a man and, got, and shed his blood for us. Allow us, his creation to, to do what we did to him. Humiliate him, hang him on the cross, kill him, and, you know, carry our sins. If, if imagine if that had to happen. We wouldn't experience that. We wouldn't experience the love of God the way we do today. So God can bring something so wicked and bring good out of it. Take yes. something so wicked and bring something so great out of it. The Bible says that what sin abounds, grace did much more abound. Yes. Praise yes. God. Amen. So, you know, in the times that we're living in today, we want to, we don't have to be discouraged. We don't, the enemy wants to make us think that he's winning, that, you know, everything's crumbling and destroying and, you know, well, first of all, when you study the scriptures, nothing is, once again, nothing is taking God by surprise. He right. said, his word prophesied all these things were going to come to pass. But then he also said, look up, because your redemption draw not. Yeah, Amen. Yeah. That we're not to allow this world and all the things that's going on in it to get us down. But we are to keep our eyes on the Lord. Amen. And did you know that God ordained for you to be here? He ordained for you to be born in this specific time. Yes. And he's created us with good works in mind. He has a, a plan for your life and a mission for you that only you can fulfill. Yes. Amen. Yes. Um, and he planned that out before you were ever born. He thought about you. The scripture tells us that, that you was in his heart and on his mind before you were ever even born. That don't necessarily mean you existed, but that means you existed in his mind and his heart because he knew one day you were going to be born. You weren't an accident, regardless of what somebody might say or people may say. You're not an accident. Praise God. And so, anyhow, I got off that to say this, that what's happening here with uh, David is that he's uh, fallen, and now uh, it's been a whole year since he went through what he went through. He uh, lusted after another man's wife, he committed adultery with her. He deceived uh, the man's the, the the man himself. Tried to get him to lay with his wife, and uh, uh, so so he would think it's his child because the woman got pregnant. And then what he ended up doing after that was he ended up sending the man into a battle, and the man got killed uh, simply because he wanted to cover up his sin. But of course, God saw all of this. So what ended up happening here was now God sent his prophet to him a year later to confront him. And uh, the simple thing is, I think this is one of the things that the Lord loved the most about David. Because when you study the scriptures and you look at King David and you look at King Saul, you're like, what's the difference between what Saul did and what David did? Well, there's a lot of difference, actually. 
between what Saul did and what David did. When you study what Saul did, it looked like God cut him off right at the beginning of his uh, kingdom. When, when he was anointed king, God cut him off immediately and told him after he disobeyed him in what seemed like not very uh, serious thing, you know, in the eyes of a man, you know, because God told him to go or wipe out the Amalekites and he didn't do everything God, he didn't follow God's instructions to the letter because he was so concerned about what the people thought of him and he wanted to be popular to the people. Oh, that's one of the things he said that came out of his own mouth. But then when you go back and look at what David did, David did all this stuff and it looked like God judged, uh, in, in a man's mind you would say God judged David, uh, Saul more harshly. But you have to go and read the whole story of Saul and see what Saul, Saul actually went into the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, not the temple, but the, he went into the uh, tabernacle and almost wiped out the priests. He went into God's house and killed all these priests simply because they assisted David. He, he did some pretty treacherous stuff and all the way up to the end of his life, but God still showed him grace all, up to the end, all the way up to the end of his life. He didn't, uh, necessarily uh, he gave him a long time to repent in other words he still showed him grace and he could have wiped him out immediately but he showed him grace and he, uh, he, he after he did all the stuff he did but the bottom line is God is the one that is the judge when we want to make sure we understand this is that God is the judge we're not because God doesn't judge and he told Samuel this about uh, David when he was getting ready to anoint David as king while Saul was still sitting on the throne, he said God doesn't see as a man sees. Right. Because what David was, what uh, the prophet uh, Samuel was about to do, he was looking at um, Jesse's sons, and he was he was wondering to anoint one of the, his other brothers because they all were tall and handsome looking men, and he assumed one of them must be the good king. But David was the youngest, so he was smaller, and God simply told him, don't judge his men. God doesn't judge his men, judge. He, judge, he don't judge the outward, he judges the heart. Amen. So, um, and it says in the book of Jeremiah that the heart is desperate. Uh, let me, let's go to that real quick. Uh, Jeremiah 17. I, I'm sure y'all are familiar with the scripture. This is uh, a quote of the scripture many times, and I'm sure I have a few times myself, but uh, we'll look at it real quick and then. I want to get back into the New Testament here after we get done with this. But y'all feel free to add, if you have anything to add to this, what I'm saying here. Lord, put something on your heart. This is something I'm trying to get to here. 17 and 9. Yes, thank you. That's the scripture 17 and 9. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then verse 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. Amen. So the Lord is the one that knows our hearts. And our heart is so deceitful that we can deceive ourselves. So we have to be mindful, we have to be prayerful, um, and we have to do a constant, the Bible tells us to examine ourselves. It tells us not to judge others, but to judge ourselves. And if we're gonna judge, we ought to judge with righteous judgment. The Bible says in Matthew chapter seven, and righteous judgment is God's word. Amen. Uh, the bottom line is, is that God is dealing with David about his situation. And uh, David simply repents on the spot. And then what the Lord says to him is that, through, through the fans of the prophet, the Lord says that you shall not die. So he didn't die on the spot. Because technically speaking, by the law, David should have been stoned. And so should Bathsheba should have been stoned by the law. So this is actually the grace of God. But the Lord said that the sword would never leave, depart from David's house because of what he had done. And I read, you can go back and read this, and we read it last time that God gave us specific was specific about what he had done in secret God was going to do to him openly. That was going to happen to him openly. God was going to expose him openly so the whole kingdom would see what, what David had done. Amen. And, uh, 
and, and as I study the scriptures, as I learned about the Lord, is that the Lord doesn't waste anything, and the Lord doesn't miss anything. Praise God. That's that's great when you're walking up right before God. You know, thank God for His grace and mercy. You know, because when you under the blood of Christ, you can forget. God said He cast your sins into the sea of forgiveness, and never to remember them no more anymore. He says that your sins are as far as the east is from the west. They'll never meet. The east and the west never meet each other. Those are two opposite directions that never meet. You can go north and south and eventually they'll meet each other, but east and west never meet. Praise God. So that's how serious God is about our sins, that he cast them that far from us. So I don't want y'all to think that you are condemned, but you have to understand that God is not, there is therefore not no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. They're walking not after the flesh, but after the spirit. But we have to do our part and walk after the spirit, amen, and not after our flesh. Because the flesh will reap death. Amen. If you walk in the flesh, the Bible says that be not deceived, God is not mocking Galatians. We read through that scripture also, y'all familiar with it, right? That God is not, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sowed, that also shall you be. Amen. So, and that simply means that we, you can't mock God. You can't trick God. You can't fool God. You can't hide anything from God. He sees our thoughts from afar. But praise God for that. You know, like I said, when, when you're seeking to obey God, God sees, he, He's not going to judge you if you fall. You know, if you're a Christian and you have a, you do something that's, you don't have to condemn yourself. He didn't even try to condemn you. God is going to say, get back up and keep moving forward. Amen? Because just like, you know, think about your baby. You know, when you got a little child, if you had a child, and when they're trying to learn to walk, man, they fall all the time. And you don't get mad at them when they fall because they're trying to learn to walk. So they got to fall a few times. Right, right. Amen. But they get back up and keep moving. They don't just say, oh, I'm done. I ain't trying to walk no more because this hurt. <laughs> Amen. So you just get up and keep moving forward. But as you learn to walk, just like a little child learn to walk in the natural, we learn to walk with the Lord and we don't fall as much. Amen. We, we start moving forward. So you don't also have to fall for a lot of that that you can't live this life. Because you know, the enemy used to tell me that stuff all the time when I was a young saint. Matter of fact, when I was uh, getting ready to receive Christ, he was telling me, you can't do that. I mean, actually that's true, I can't do it. It's said by the power of God. But I just chose to believe what God was saying to me. Because I knew he was speaking to me. With the honor shadow of doubt, because every time I thought something, the preacher would answer my question. I would think a question in my mind, you know, when they did the altar call, and immediately that preacher would answer that question like we was having a conversation one-on-one. -on -one. And that happened about three times. I was like, that's it. I'm done now. <laughs> I'm getting up there. So I didn't care if nobody else went up there. I jumped up out of my seat and went to the front and, you know, got up there, closed my eyes, surrendered to the Lord. When I opened my eyes, there was people all around me got up. I got up and gave their life to the Lord. Praise yeah. God. So anyway, my point here is that I, I just wanted to show y'all this in the Old Testament, that God showed grace to David, but, but the consequences of what David did didn't go away. Amen. I mean, uh, God is gracious God, and he's a loving God. And his, his word says that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all will come to repentance. But we know not everyone is going to come to repentance. But that still is the desire of God's heart. Praise God. So um, you can look at those scriptures. Well, let's go ahead and go to the New Testament. We're going to go to uh, Acts chapter 5 again. Uh, talk about Ananias and Sapphira once again. And then I got another place that I didn't get to last time that we'll look at. And I just mentioned here already about the Lord looking on our heart, I just want to say a couple of things about that also. Um, we talked about this last time, and I thought this was something, because when the Lord gave this to me, I was like, I heard the story, I read the story in the Bible, but I never paid attention to that it was Acts chapter 5, 5 is the number of grace. So I was like, Lord, what kind of message are you trying to send with this particular, you know, God, nothing is by accident with the Lord. God doesn't, there's no such thing as an accident with the Lord. Uh, 
bless the Lord, hallelujah. Ain't even there yet. I'm still in the Old Testament. Turn that with y'all real quick and let's read this. And we're not going to talk a whole lot about this unless y'all have something to add to it, but we talked about this already because I want to get to this one last thing in a couple of other scriptures. Praise God. But I just want to refresh our memory here. I, I think I started at, uh, Sorry. actually I started at, chapter four. Yeah, chapter four, exactly. Verse 33. So what's, what's happened already is the church has been birthed, amen. And now God is moving in a mighty way. Let's read what it says in 4, 33. Multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither was there any of them that all of the things that of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. That's that's power. Great grace was upon them all. I love the way that reads. Because great grace is upon us all also. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of land or houses sold them, sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Now that's powerful. I want to go back and look at something here real quick. What they said about they were, and the multitude of them that believed were one heart and one soul. That is, isn't that something we talk about every Sunday? We, yes, that's, that we speak the same thing, that there be no division among us, that we be perfectly joined together. See, if you want to see a great move of God, you have to be on one accord in order for the Spirit of God to move the way He wants to. Because God, you can't. The Bible does say in the Old Testament, the children of Israel lived in the whole of one of Israel because they didn't obey God. They didn't obey God. They limited the Holy One of Israel. And you think about that, that's a powerful statement. God was limited by their unbelief because of what He wanted to do in their lives. But look what God is doing here. He's moving. These people are on one accord and He's moving in a mighty way. So let's keep that in mind. And then, now, now they're displaying the love of God because now they're meeting the needs of everyone. And this is, I, I, I say, this is like a template for what the church should look like today. Amen. We should be, it's not the government's responsibility to meet the needs of the poor. It's the church's responsibility to show the love of God. And I'm not saying the government can't get involved in that, but man, we got a whole lot more churches. And why, why, why couldn't the church... Why can't the church be more effective than the government? Because actually when you go read the scriptures and study the scriptures out, the government has a mission, and the mission of the government and God is, a, the, the church is, the government is ordained by the God, just like the church is ordained by God. But the church has a mission that's ordained by God, which is a higher mission than the government. But the government also has a mission that's ordained by God. Their mission is to protect the, the country. That's the mission of the church, I mean the government, amen? And they're not, their mission is not to get into doing stuff like uh, that the church's mission. You understand what I'm saying? And I'm not saying that there's no, the, the, the government actually job is to protect us, to also to protect the church. We, we, we hear a lot of stuff today in uh, politics saying that you don't, you don't uh, mix Separation of church and state. That's not in our constitution. I'm here to tell y'all that that's not in our constitution. Our constitution does not say that. It actually, that's a communist constitution that says that, not yeah. The, yeah. our constitution. Because what they, they, they want to separate the church and state so the church has no influence over the state. When you start thinking like that, that's when you start getting a godless government. And then the government becomes your God and then you depend on the government for everything and you depend on God for nothing. Right. 
that's the that's the that's the strategy of the enemy. So now God has already laid out a specific plan for the government and a specific plan for the church. So you look at the blue the the template here for the church. They're on one accord. They're moving now. They're meeting the needs of everyone. They're showing displaying the love of God. Now watch what happens. So they laid all the stuff down at the apostles' feet, and then the next thing you read is, well, I'll just keep reading. And Rosés, is that how you say that? So say, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation and Levite and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Then verse five, I mean chapter five, verse one says, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold the possession. They sold the possession and then kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So what is their mission right there? Why do they do that? She said greed, deceit. Well, I think they, they wanted to be part of the group. They wanted to be, set the example as part of this, but they wanted to glorify themselves. They, 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 to the I agree with all of that, what you said and what you said. They, they had an uh, ulterior motive, because everyone else's motive was pure. And it's something how, uh, it listed all these other people that didn't listen to any of them by name. Then it listed Barnabas, and then they come right behind Barnabas, trying to look like Barnabas to do what he did. But they they have ulterior motives because the way they did it tells what their motives are. That they are they're holding back. They decided, well, we're going to hold back part of this, but we want to look like we're giving it all up. So we're going to lay it at the apostles' feet like everyone else. Then Peter reacts to it. But when you go back and look at Peter, um, there's a couple places here where it's talking about Peter being filled with the Holy Ghost. And when he was filled with the Holy Ghost, he did he spoke certain things and he did certain things. Now this Peter said to but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Now who's the judge of the heart? So we just read that in uh, Jeremiah, the Lord is the one that judges the heart. So this came out of Peter's mouth, but he's been inspired by God to speak these words. Because he couldn't have known what was in this man's heart unless the Lord, the Holy Ghost is the one that exposed this. That this was in this man's heart. So he's asking this question, why he filled your heart. Now the next, the, the, the last time I read this was, you go over to the Gospels and Jesus said that Satan entered Judas's heart. When, when Satan entered into Judas's heart, then Judas went out to betray him. Uh, think about that. Does Satan have the power to enter your heart without your permission? You got to do something. Because if Satan could do that without our permission, we'd all be, <laughs> we'd be a mess. Amen. <laughs> so thank God God put restraints on the enemy. He don't have the authority to do what he want to do. But he does know his legal Authority. He can he can do something when you allow him to. So he felt this heart to do this. And then his wife, and the scripture's careful to point out that his wife was privy to it. It wasn't just him. They 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 colluded together to do this. Amen. Yes. No, I was gonna say we get back in uh, chapter four, verse two. It says the most of them that believe were one heart and one soul. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at an eyes that rise situation where their heart was at. He said that they feel their heart come to the uh, realization that they weren't part of the group. They didn't have that in common. They weren't actually believers. Man, you, you, you all over my message, man. Praise <laughs> God. You don't have to apologize. All you're doing is confirming what I was going to say next. Because we talked about this. See, he and I had a discussion about this. And God showed me something. I went back and looked at this again and I read it and amplified it. But amen. He just told y'all what we, we're going to cover. Amen. Amen. No, that's good. That's good. I got something to confirm what he just said. That's powerful. Praise God. He, they never was among them. So we understand this, that God is at work. 
when God is at work and it's a great move, plus this is, you got to realize this is the infancy of the church. The enemy is trying to stop this thing at the beginning. So if I could get people to, if I could get them, that's how hard the enemy is trying to fight to keep them from being on one accord. Because God is moving mightily. And he know what God's in the wreck shop. Because he got some people who allowing him to use them. Amen. So he, he sent his spies in and they look like everybody else, but they not acting like everybody else. They doing things differently than everybody else is. Amen. So, well, that was good, bro. <laughs> I can't wait to say it. <laughs> while it remains. So now Peter is still confronting him. He said, while it remains, was it not in thy was it not thine own? So what it, basically what Peter is saying to him is, this was yours. Before you you owned this property. So all you had to do was really come clean about what you're doing. I'm gonna give part of it, it's not all of it. It was yours to do with what you wanted. But y'all decided to lie to the Holy Ghost because now it looked like, because they surnamed him Barnabas, son of consolation. It's like, okay, we want some of this glory. Exactly what you said. We want some of this glory for ourselves. So we want to look like everybody else. So maybe we'll get a high position. Who knows what they're there, there, there's some ulterior motives there, but God stopped it immediately. He, he could have stopped to it on the spot. And so, and I told y'all this story about, you know, when we first started this ministry, how the Lord, uh, uh, we was taking a communion, and the Lord put on my heart to read this very scripture. And it turned out when it was, when the whole thing was said and done, there was a, a young lady that was coming to the church, but she was practicing witchcraft. And uh, of course I didn't know that, but I just, I didn't understand it. But you know, a lot of things you don't understand when God tells you to do it, you just do it. You don't try to figure out the mind of yeah. God, you just obey God. Yeah, well, yeah. long story short, she took the communion and she started choking. Yeah, to the point where we had to take her to the back and lay hands on her and pray for her. And you know, ask God not to kill her. Because we didn't know what was going on, but God exposed it, and she never came back to church after that. We prayed for her, you know, but she, uh, she got exposed. Yeah, because she was, she had ulterior motives. The same thing with these people, had ulterior motives. So we read this story before. I don't want to go on and read the rest of it to y'all. Well, wouldn't mind. Actually, I'm going to have to. Let me finish this. I'm looking at the clock, and I'm like, man, I still ain't got to what I wanted to get to. Yes. Yeah, because they what, they, what God is showing you in this message is timing exactly what you've been teaching so far about grace. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the, I looked at the translations of their names, mm -hmm. what uh, Ananias means, means Jehovah is giving you uh, grace. Mm -hmm. Zechariah, however, is means sapphire or precious stone. Mm -hmm. So if you look back in the Old Testament, it just ties it back to the Old Testament, with the use of where the ephod, mm -hmm. that was the fifth stone. Mm -hmm. Wow. Sapphire. Wow. And it resided in the middle of the heart. Wow. wow. So, hold on. <laughs> so, 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 wow. Ananias entered in, and Zachariah entered in, grace in the law. And it did, because the ephod was worn for judgment, the high priest wore that to enter into the tabernacle as a means to judge the people. So, the stones, precious stones, represent the law as far as judgment. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> when you look wow. at this story, when it's time when we say about grace and law, it can't mix. Because when grace enters in, grace has to fall. When you pervert grace, grace has to be killed, destroyed, and now you have nothing else but law. Mm -hmm. But the law is already dead. Wow. Under grace, so. Wow. But that's good stuff. So, so. Wow, that's, that's, that's good stuff. That, that's powerful. So when the, when you go to, and that's something else I wanted to touch on was about when Paul said the truth, when he told the Galatians, oh fools, Galatians, who have to, who have deceived you to get you to go back to, to move from grace back to the law? Yes, right. Then he said, if you if you go back to the law, you've fallen from grace. Amen. You've fallen from grace. So that's that's very praise God. See, when you see God for an answer about something, He will answer your question. He's not trying to hide anything from you. He wants you to. To, to know the truth, amen. He wants to get a full revelation to you. Yes. Praise God, thank you, brother, amen. Because that's powerful. That's very powerful. So all I was gonna do was take y'all to the next verse down there. After you see what happened to Ananias, and I had looked up the names, but I didn't get that where he got out of there. That was powerful. 
So, all I was going to do is read down to after Ananias fell dead for lying to the Holy Ghost, then three hours later, Sapphira came in and she fell dead. And then it goes on to say, has anybody got an amplified version? Oh, you got that up there? Go ahead and pull up a uh, verse. He's already getting an answer to it, but we'll just look at it. She fell dead, then great fear fell upon everyone. Then it says, uh, verse 12, go to verse 12. Now the hands, by the hands of the apostles, especially messengers, numerous and stalling signs and wonders were being performed among the people. And by common consent, they all met together at the temple in the cover, covered porch. A uh, walk called Solomon's and none of those that were not of the number there to join or associate with them. Because they knew, apparently the outsiders knew these people weren't, and not the Sapphire wasn't with them. But they had tried to join with them, but no one else dared to try that after that happened. And then, but the people held them in high regard and praised and much and made much of them. And more, but then it goes on to say, and more and more there were being added to the Lord, added to the Lord those who believed. So the, the, the fakers stopped trying to get, be added to them, but the true believers kept being added to them. So that is powerful, how God did what he did with the early church. Amen. And see, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. See, the, the, the part we miss is that we see the love of God and how they reached out and started meeting people's needs that no one suffered lack. Man, could you imagine if that happened in the church today? We could change this country instantly. We got so many people that claim to be believers, but we're, we, we need to be love and action, and, and not just by word, but by deed. We, we can stop all this nonsense the enemy has got going on in our country. We have the power and authority to do that. But we have to walk in the love of God. That's, that's so good, isn't it? Praise God. I still didn't get to the next group that I wanted to read. But I think we got, to, we got to the point. Amen. The whole point was that, man, God, God is not to be taken lightly. But God is so loving and so awesome. But he's... You know, like a good parent, you know, I, I hate to use that analogy because it's not quite, it's not quite enough. But you know, as a good parent, you love your kids, you're not trying to be their buddy. When they mess up, you spank their little honeys, but you still love them. Because you have to correct them. The Bible tells us that, that you, if you don't correct your children, you don't love them. Because they're never going to learn to respect authority if they can't respect authority in their house. You know, the world tells us all kinds of stuff like, don't spank your kids because you're going to scar them and stuff. Really? Who knows better? Man or God? The one that created us or the creation? This his, his word says, uh, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from them. And he goes on to say that if you don't uh, discipline your child, you don't love them. You, you love yourself more than you love your child because you worry about what they gonna think about you. This is a child. They need you to correct them. They want you to. They want to feel secure. And then if you don't correct them, then the society is going to deal with them when they grow up. Amen. <laughs> we, we get the point, right? Yes. What's so awesome about the Lord is He knows our hearts. He loves us, man. He loves us. We, we, we're the ones who don't know our hearts. We have to examine our heart all the time to see what's in there and keep bringing it before the Lord. The Lord, show me my heart. Man, you pray that prayer. You got to be ready. <laughs> but you know what? Thank God for His Word. Because boy, David said, Thy word have I hidden my, in my heart that I might not sin against you. This is the remedy for a wicked heart. God's word. Amen. That's right. God can change our heart, but we have to be want, we have to want that. Amen. Amen. And, then, and then there's so many examples in the scriptures of men that followed after God with their whole heart. And God used them mightily. You know, we the Sunday, uh, two Sundays ago when I got up here, 
And I talked about uh, Elijah and Elisha. And you saw the example of how the Lord used Elisha. Because, man, when he got called, that brother was like, I'm sold out. I'm getting rid of everything from my past. I'm destroying it. I'm going to I'm I'm destroy the plow, and I'm going to cook the ox with the with the wood from the plow. That's how serious I am about my walk with God because I'm not looking back. I'm, I'm, that stuff was behind me. It's done. I, I don't even have an option to go back no more. And you know something? When I got up here to the pulpit and I started talking about that, the Lord immediately showed me this. Because that's exactly what his testimony was. You know, his testimony is. Amen. That when he gave his life to the Lord, that brother was like, I'm sold out. I'm not going back. As a matter of fact, Everything that I owned, that I got illegally, I'm getting rid of it. You know, y'all, y'all can hear his testimony from him. Amen. That's that's something to praise God about. You know what's so awesome about it is that we we don't have to just apply to mission. It can apply to each one of us. We can be sold out for God like that because God want to use you just as mightily as He used Bishop. Amen. He's no respect of the person. So if you to make up your mind to sell out for the Lord if, if you haven't done it already. All I'm saying is it's number two, it's not too late, amen. Yeah. You can do that today. Yeah. Amen. You can just say, man, this God is real. Yeah. And I'm gonna get real with him. Because yeah. he knows everything about me anyway. Why I'm why try to hide anything from him? Yeah. You know, think about it. Uh, the Lord, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking about this, I was thinking about because I was going over this lesson, I'm thinking about Ananias and Sapphira, and I'm thinking about uh, Judas. Judas will walk with the Lord. And the Lord already knew Judas was, wasn't going to turn. He knew. He called Judas the son of perdition. But this guy walked with the Lord, saw all those miracles. So, you know, he he was close to the Lord. God, the Lord, the Lord called him his friend. He carried the money. He, he, when, when they when they ate the, the last supper that we famously call it that, he was sitting next to him. So the thing about that is, is that that's how easily we can deceive ourselves. You know, because he deceived himself. He had all that opportunity to repent. He could still repent it, even after he he had worldly sorrow after the Lord was uh, after he turned the Lord in, and the enemy got up and to do that, then kill him. Let him, you know, drop him, kill himself. Instead of repenting, he killed himself. And, and then Ananias and Sapphira, they were among the people. They could have true, they could have truly repented. They could have been among the people. They, they didn't have to be just among them. They could have been with them. They could have been on one accord with them. Even when they got called out, they could have repented on the spot. I'm wrong. I've been busted. Okay, I repent. I'm sorry. But they didn't. And they ended up suffering the consequences of it. But God is so gracious, he still gave them a chance. That's, that's all I want to say about the grace of God. The, the Bible says that in Romans, uh, what were we saying? In Romans 6 and 1, talking about, you know, uh, so, so we continue in sin that grace may abound. God forbid, the Bible says. Amen. We, 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 can't, we don't do that, man. Because there's consequences behind. You can't, you can't treat God. Why play around? If I was going to play around, man, let me just go back in the world and play around. I don't want to be up in here playing around because I get my ever and survivor experience. Amen. Yes. Praise God. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. God is good. Amen. Well, anybody have anything else to add? Because I want to try to get, I know these kids got to get in here and practice. So. Yes. I had something in the very beginning when you were talking about Second Samuel 9 about the grace of God. Mm -hmm. The condition that they found Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. The, the condition that they found him in. It, David is like an example of the second half. He's an example of Jesus mm -hmm. and the love of God and the love of Jesus for us. The condition they found him in, he was crippled. And they found him in a place called Lodabar, mm -hmm. which the translation of that means not a pastor. They mm -hmm. found him in the desert crippled. And wow. that's, I think every person in this room can identify with that kind of grace. Yes. We were found in the desert crippled. Yes. And now we're sitting at the king's table. Mm -hmm. so yes. That's the grace. Yeah, without the past. 
Yeah. Without a pastor. Not, not a pastor. Not a pastor. In so the like a sheep that's that got removed from the pasture into a desert where you just die. Because there's nothing for him to feed on. That, and he's crippled, he can't even move around, and he's just there to die. But David came in and brought him out of the desert back into the pasture and then says, fed him at the king's table. Yes. The king's yes. food. He ate, at the, yes. he ate at the king's table the rest of his life. Yes. That is powerful. That's a powerful picture of our relationship with the Lord. Thank you. And Ephesians uh, 2.1 says that he has quickened us or made us alive even when Dead our trespasses and our sins. Amen. And that's, that's yes, the that's condition we found us in. That's the grace. Yes. Even though we were dead in our trespasses and our sins. Say that again, Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 1. 2 and 1. Amen. That's powerful. Yes. Okay. And it's a beautiful picture. Amen. Yes. Did you, brother? I'm going to add, not only did he brought him to the king's table, not only that he ate at the king's but he was restored everything yes. that his grandfather owned had. Yes. All that saw him yes. had, everything was restored. His land, him. his riches, everything. his servants. Amen. And, 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 David, and David didn't take it. David knew all the stuff that belonged to him, and he restored it all back to him. Restored and more. This is preached a message about that. Yes. And that's a beautiful picture. And that's what the Lord said, man. The Lord, when he restored you, he don't just give you back what you had before. He restores you with more. Yes. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And the yes. servants, he told them whatever, he told them, you're going to work four him. Yes. He didn't have to work at all. Yes. Never even more. I was like, I was so, so what in my mind, I said, so what he did was he never touched anything when it came to Saul, let the servants take care of it. They were already taking care of it. And I was like, wow. I mean, he never touched anything that was Saul's at all. Right. Let his servants still take care of, be a steward over what right, was still right. Saul. You're, you're right. Yes, that is what he did. Mm -hmm. The servant was a steward, and then when the criticism showed up on the scene, like he's the rightful owner of this. So now the servant is working for him. And that's a picture of us when we come into grace. We don't have to work for salvation. You don't have to work. Amen. You 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 produce works. Godly um, faith produces works. Your faith is works in action. But you don't have to work to be saved. Praise God. That is uh, that is awesome. Jesus plus nothing is salvation. Because if you add anything to Jesus, that's no longer now, now you're you adding works to salvation. Now it's no longer salvation. Now you fall from grace, as we were just talking about. So praise God. We have to walk in this thing. And people don't like you to teach on grace because they think that you're giving people a license to sin. But God, if you if you have a heart for God, it says that right there. So we are we to remain in sin in order that God's grace and favor, favor and mercy may multiply and overflow. God forbid. God forbid. That's not how it works. You don't sin more so you can get more grace. No. That's not what we're teaching. God hates sin. That's why he died to separate you from sin. So yes. sin wouldn't separate you from him. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God.